I did freeze my hand on my doorknob, though. Wasn't quite ready for that, though I should have been. I've got no excuse. I've lived up here for all these years. If you have your Bible tonight, uh, this morning, why don't you take it, if you will, open it to the book of Titus chapter 2 once again. Titus chapter 2. I spoke at the retreat yesterday. I found out Friday morning that I was needing to speak, so I scrambled and and, uh, but I left my Bible there, and so I got this Bible here, and I can't read it. It's just really, I need the extra giant super duper print now. What are you laughing at over there? Your day is coming. Hopefully not. Maybe we'll all get out of here before that day. But you know, since I returned from our trip to Ecuador, I've really <coughs> started kind of a mini-series, as I'm sure most of you have noted on exploring the perspective that the scriptures put forth for us as believers in Christ regarding the imminent return of our Savior. It could happen today. It could happen at any time. There's no signs that need to take place before it happens. And frankly, as each day passes, I can't wait. And, uh, you know, life for the child of God is to be lived daily and moment by moment in anticipation of this. And it's, the more I read, the more I see it's really a thread that runs through Uh, the New Testament, even in the book of James here. You know, James is writing to some people that are suffering. He begins his epistle by saying, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And at the end, because of the injustice that they were receiving, he says, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. You know, that's the way to think. Um, You know, the world is waxing worse and worse, according to 2 Timothy. It's not really going to get better. And uh, we need to keep in mind uh, our lives in light of that reality, in light of the reality of even what James says earlier in the epistle. He said, come now, you who say, in chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we're going to go to such and such a city. We're going to spend a year. We're going to buy, sell. We're going to make a profit. Life's going to be grand. And here's the reality. You don't know what will happen tomorrow. And what's your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But James asks a very interesting question here. What is your life? And so someone stops you on the street and says, what's your life? How are you going to answer it? Well, James said very plainly, life's a vapor. Kind of like the uh, drive by the paper mill on the way to church and the steam comes out and then it's gone. And that's your life. It's short. It's uncertain. There's no guarantees about tomorrow, let alone next year or the next 10 years or whatever it might be. You know, there's people around the world this morning thinking that this would be just another day and they may not make it through the day. That's the reality. You could be young and healthy this morning and yet be a corpse by midnight tonight. We're really not in control like we'd like to think we are. And that's a reality that most people would rather not even think about. But you know, knowing your life is a vapor, and it is, it's just poof. And knowing you have a hope waiting for you, and Christ can get back any time, your life should be different than just merely living. The goal of life is not just to live. The unsaved are doing that. Most of them aren't doing it as well as they'd like. And I'm sure a lot of them are still trying to figure out what the point of it all is. But the implication here is that instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we should do that. In other words, your goal in life should say, you know what, Lord, what is your will for me today? What would you have me to do? How would you have me to think? You're to be living with an eternal purpose because you have one in the Lord Jesus Christ as his child. And so doing the will of God is to be paramount in your thinking, is to be saying, hmm, this is why I'm here. Now, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know from Romans 12, too, that God's will for you is good, it's acceptable, it's perfect, it can't be improved upon. And when the dust settles and the smoke clears and you and I stand before Christ, 
That's going to be the topic of discussion. And God's got a will for all mankind, and, and it begins with salvation. Second, 1 Timothy 2, 4, and 6 say, God desires all people, not some, but all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And he provided a means for that to happen. There's one God, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. See, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And you and I are sinners, and every sinner needs to be saved. That's the reality of, of what happened to us and Adam. You know, but a question I could pose here is, since death is certain, and the time of death is uncertain, what is the most important thing? How do you answer that? What's the most important thing? Is it the Super Bowl later tonight? It might be for some, and that just shows, unfortunately, the shallowness of their existence. You know, there's a sense of urgency here, because we, why? Well, this is what Paul said. He said, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So why? Why is now? Why is it? Because here's the urgency. You don't know what's on tomorrow. You don't know what's on tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Who here knows with 100% certainty what's going to happen to them tomorrow? Any hands? No. Because you can't know. You might have a good idea. You might even have a high degree of certainty that you've got, you know, you know generally what might happen tomorrow should you live another day. But you know, Jesus also said this to a guy who was living the high life and said, you know what, I gotta build bigger barns. I don't got enough room to hold my stuff. And this is one of the few times God in scripture called someone a fool. You fool. This night your soul will be required of you and then whose will those things be which you have provided? Boom. And here's the principle, so is he. You're just like the fool who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If your life is wrapped up in the nasty now and now and trying to milk this baby for all it's worth, that's a big swing and a miss. You're basically acting like a fool. That's the implication of what God says here. He also said, Christ said, what's it profit a man if he gains the whole world and wastes his life, loses his soul? This guy had it all planned out, but he didn't take into account two major things. One, God's sovereignty, and two, his own mortality. You know, God is sovereign over all of us. Psalm 139 tells us that before we were even born, and eternity past, the number of our days on earth have already been established. Interesting, isn't it? And it's easy for us not to take in God's sovereignty and not think of our own mortality, to be consumed with what's in front of us. And yet everything we do should be done in light of this reality that's even communicated in Hebrews 9.27. It's appointed that a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. We're all on the road that leads to death, barring the rapture. And at the end of that road, after you die, there's going to be a judgment, an evaluation. Now, there's two, as I mentioned last time. There's one for the unsaved and one for the saved. But because the unsaved's judgment results in the degree of torment in hell, Jesus also said these words, fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him, that's God, who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And the word destroy there means to put to ruin, not annihilate. And so when it comes to the will of God and it comes to the reality of the world we live in, this brings into focus the importance of knowing what your eternal destiny is. And Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and we're all sinners because we're born in Adam, we're born dead to God in trespasses and sins. We have no relationship with him. And the word death there means separation, and so all of mankind is born separated from God and has no relationship with him. And that's because we're born in Adam. Adam's nature was passed down to me through, it's called inherited sin, and Adam's sin was put to my account. And this is why Romans 5.12 tells us that all die. But because that problem exists and because there's nothing we can do to rectify that problem, God, in his amazing grace, offers what the Bible refers to, not by name, but by concept, the great exchange. He's willing to take your sin in exchange for his righteousness. This is the best deal going in the universe. 
2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, God, made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for or on the behalf of us, to what end? That we could become the righteousness of God in him. His righteousness put to our account. See, the good news of the gospel, and that's what Christ accomplished on the cross, is he paid a debt he did not know because we had a debt we could not pay. All the good works in the world cannot change the fact that you're a sinner. They cannot pay for sin. Only the shedding of blood pays for sin. And so death is the required payment. And if you die, there's no opportunity then for you to be saved. Someone else has to die. Someone who's righteous, someone who has not sinned, and that's Christ, who's willing to offer his payment in the place of ours. God can't change who he is. He has to pour out his wrath upon sin, but in love, as Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his own love toward us. While we were still sinners, Christ punished his own son in our place. So on that cross, when the whole world went dark, and Christ screamed, my God, my God, why hast why thou forsaken me? All of the wrath of God toward sin was poured out on him. And thankfully, he cried out, it is finished, as we sang earlier, paid in full. There's nothing left to be done. And so understanding salvation means you understand that your negative righteousness, and to get to heaven, you have to have righteousness, which you don't have. You're dead to God in your sins. You are worthy of the penalty for sin, which is eternity separated from God from hell. This is the bad news. And then you've got to recognize the good news in Christ. He was perfectly righteous. He was God. He became a man. <clears throat> and on that cross, he took your sins upon himself, paid, them for, paid for them in full, rose again. And the moment you put your trust in him and him alone, an exchange takes place. His righteousness is put to your account. You're now accepted perfectly in the beloved one according to Ephesians 1. Eternity is now, eternity in heaven is now yours as a free gift. But Christ is the way, the truth, and the light. There is no salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation is a must and only comes through Christ. So the decision each individual faces, though in most cases they're oblivious to it, is who's going to pay for their sins? Are they going to accept the payment that Jesus made for them and know they have eternal life based on his work and his promise? Or are they even going to care? Or are they going to try to work them off themselves? That is the trouble. That's the problem with even religion and its false promise that you can actually earn your way to heaven. The good news is when you get saved, your destiny is settled. And then you have the rest of your life to live with purpose. But you know, James, again, here says what? Your life is a vapor. Poof. That's it. And it reminds us that life is frail. It's frail. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen 10 minutes from now. Neither do I. You know, in this context here, there were some believers who were proud and arrogant and said, you know, we're going to go over here and we're going to make it rich. We're going to do it. We're going to pull this baby off. They were presuming all kinds of things about the future they didn't know. Not only did they not know it, they weren't in control of it. And they had no guarantees for it. And so life is uncertain in that regard, and it's frail. It's also, whoops, very short. How long does vapor last? How long does the exhaust that comes out of your tailpipe last before it dissipates? Not real long. It's short. The steam on your coffee, short. You know, we've been praying for Eric Hayes. I mean, he's just a guy in his 40s, lollygagging along in life, and finds out he's got stage 4 cancer. Just like that. Boom. You know, I preached on Psalm 90 yesterday at the college retreat. And Psalm 90, verse 10 says, The years of our life are 70, and even by reason of strength are 80. And yet, what are they full of? Toil, trouble, hardship. There's obviously transitory joy, but there's also sorrow and difficulties. And then it's gone, and you fly away. And so you start here, and you might make it here, but this is where it is. That's your 80 years right there. It's much better than those evolutionary charts you see that are kind of similar. <laughs> 
And so what did he say in light of this reality? Who knows the power of your anger? You know, I think Moses wrote this psalm because in Numbers chapter 20, if you read this, he, the beginning of the chapter, Miriam dies. Halfway through the chapter, the people are whining, something different. And God told him, he said, talk to the rock, and that rock will give water. Well, in his anger, he smacked the rock twice. And so God says, because you didn't believe me, you can't go to the promised land. And then at the end of the chapter, which is only 20-some verses long, his brother Aaron dies. And so here he's been stuck 40 years with his people that all they do is whine. The two people that he's closest to die. And he says, how do I deal with this? This is the answer right here. Teach us to number our days. Your days are already numbered. The issue is, am I going to number them? Am I going to take them into account? Am I going to realize that eternity is in this minute today? In this hour today? Every decision I make has an eternal consequence. Because I'm going to give an account of it just as you. And God wants us to think in these terms because we only got one shot at this. If I blew the last five minutes, I can't get that back. I can only make an adjustment going forward. That's why time spent is time spent. I've used the illustration before. If you got a one quarter and you had to make one decision with that quarter, would you go drop her in a gumball machine or would you think it through a little bit? You'd probably think it through a little bit, right? You know, it's weird. I'm thinking, I feel like I just became an adult. I'm in my 60s. It's like, where did my life go? It's crazy. But another thing this reminds me of, James' message in James says, is that death is certain. As I've said before, the statistics are pretty good. One out of one dies. It's not like it's profitable, probable rather, but it's, it's certain. And in the deepest recess in our souls, Ecclesiastes 3 says that God has put eternity in our hearts. So everyone in the deepest part of their brain knows that death is in the end of it all. They may ignore it, they may deny it, and they may suppress it, but it's there. And we're going to give an account. And so you think that somewhere there they're just saying, you know, I need to get right with God here. And we live in a day and age where because especially these young adults who have been taught their whole entire life that God doesn't exist, that they're a product of apes or whatever else, theolo whatever else ev uh, evolutionary train of thought they've been exposed to. They've been told there's no point to it all. Life is hard, they're not equipped to deal with it, and the suicide rate's off the chart. And Satan claims another soul. They're not even thinking about it. It's crazy. But you know, as a believer in Christ, there's an added dimension to your life. We have the return of the Savior, which could happen at any moment. And you're going to make an account again of the life you lived as am I, post-salvation. The stakes are different. The outcome is different. The issue there is going to be reward. But how is that affecting how you think today and the decisions you're making today? and how you view the people that God has put in your life around you. These are the things we need to think about. Because the reality, again, is that eternity is in every one of our minutes until we go home to be with the Lord. And so this came into my focus after the election, and it should have been in my focus all along. And I'm just thinking we need to all just realize that the time is short. And this is why we started this message by saying, because we should be eyeing eternity, we should be making the most of our opportunities that God gave us. This was Paul's admonition to the Ephesians. He says, look carefully then how you walk. Walk circumspectly. Not as an unwise person, but as a wise person. Making the best use of your time. You know, I, as I mentioned Wednesday night, one of my favorite verses is Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, because... God's mercies are new every morning because so many days, at the end of the day, I said, where was my brain today? You know, what did I do? I mean, good night. I'm so glad I can put that behind me 
And I got a brand new day with brand new mercies from a God who loves me supremely. So I can make the best use of my time. Why? The days are evil. And so don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. This is how someone with an eye in eternity, the Spirit of God wants to get them to think this way. We also saw that having an eye in eternity, you shouldn't be losing heart in life. And we looked at 2 Corinthians 4. Even though the outer man is wasting away, our inner man is being renewed day by day, this momentary affliction, it's light, is preparing for us an eternal way to glory beyond all comparison. And so our focus is to be what? Not on the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, because the things that are seen are transient, they're temporal. The things that are not seen, things that God sees, are eternal. And then we said, because with an eye in eternity, we're to be pursuing personal holiness. And we looked at several verses there. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. But behold what manner of God, excuse me, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Amazing. The world doesn't get it because it doesn't know him. But beloved, verse 2, now that we are the children of God, it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know this. When he is revealed at the appearing, at the rapture, we're going to be like him. We're going to see him as he is, how is that designed to get you to look at life? Everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself as he is pure. We saw this from Peter. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon the graces to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where are your sights to be set fully that the grace is going to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And how's that to affect you? As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct, because it's written, be holy for I am holy. That's how it's designed to get you to think. And so the principle is you set your hope and your perspective on Christ and his coming back for you, the conduct that's to flow out of that is with an eye on personal holiness, allowing God to work in you and through you to that particular end. And then we saw this is true in Titus. Paul said the same thing to Titus. Peter said the same thing. John has said the same thing. Now Paul is saying the same thing. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that to deny ungodliness and war the lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I was talking about this verse with Jolene this week, and as we talked, took the word grace and replaced it with Jesus. Now we can say the love of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, that brings salvation to spirit to man. And it's Jesus himself and his grace that what? teaches us to deny godliness. Isn't that nice? It's not, you know, Christianity is in rules and regulations. It's not a moral code to live by. It's responding to an individual who loves you and wants to transform you from the inside out. And he teaches you as you focus on his love and mercy and are transformed by the word of God to deny the ungodliness and worldly lusts that are constantly bombarding our thinking. It's Jesus who teaches us to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. And it's Jesus there that is beckoning us to look at that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. In fact, we saw that these qualities, in other words, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts and living soberly and righteously and godly, are realized as we eagerly wait for the imminent return of the Savior. As we eagerly wait. The word looking here doesn't mean looking like this. It means a mindset that says, I'm anticipating, I'm waiting, like a little kid waiting to go see Mickey Mouse at Disney World or whatever. That's the idea. As we wait, this is the thing that's floating my boat and driving my bus. I'm waiting for the Savior. Is that how you're thinking this week? This is how we're to think. This is how we're to live our lives. These are the foundational principles that are to drive each one of us.
But not only that, God, these qualities are realized when we look back at, at the cross of our Savior and embrace his purposes in time. How do we know that? Well, I am out of whack. Any, why? Well, we're to be looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior who gave himself for us. So we're looking ahead and yet we're looking behind at the foundation of all this. He gave himself for a purpose. The word that means in order that. He could redeem us from every lawless deed and secondly, purify himself as his own special people. And here's the goal of it all, zealous good works. And so God gave himself to set us free. That's what the word redeem there was. Set us free from every kind of lawlessness. That's what he did on the cross. Not only did he pay for our sins, he broke the power of canceled sin so we can walk in newness of life and don't have to serve the sin nature like we did prior to salvation. We were freed from that. And so negatively, he freed you and he freed me from every lawless deed. And then secondly, he purified you for himself. Isn't that amazing? Christ loves you so much he can't wait to receive you onto himself. That's how much he loves you. I mean, come on. He says, I've made you my own special person. You're my special possession, he's saying. See, positively, Jesus purified you and made you his own. The word means special possession. I'm special to Jesus. There's no one else like me. And there's no one else like you. But we're all special to him. And to what end? As a special person, what is to characterize you? We saw this. Being zealous for good works. Isn't that interesting? God says, not only did I take you out of the pit of sin positionally, I put you in Christ. You're my own special person. And I put within your heart a mindset through a new nature that you'd be zealous for good works. That's what it is. Zealous for good works. We saw last time, it's not in your handout, but the word zeal there means being on fire for something. So God put a fire in your heart in Christ to do something outside of yourself. Satan put a fire in your heart to only think about you, yourself, and you. And as a new creation in Christ, you're a different creature with different objectives and a different heart. Amazing, isn't it? And Paul brought this out in his letter to the Ephesians. He said, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not of works, or you'd have something to boast about. And he says, for we are, we are his workmanship, his handiwork, a new creation. We're created, didn't say we're just created, but we're created in Christ Jesus. We have a, a new position in life and a new purpose for living. For what? Good works. In fact, God says, I've prepared beforehand X amount of good works that, you wanna, that I want you to do before I take you home. Doesn't that simplify life when you look at it that way? I mean, life's complex and it's all kinds of things going on and yet when you step back and look at the big picture, sometimes you say, you know what, it's really not all that complicated. Now just to help you see that this is about salvation, it's not about faith. For you have been saved. The whole context of Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is about salvation. It's not about faith, it's about salvation. You're saved how? By grace. That's God giving you something you don't deserve. What's your responsibility? To place your faith in Christ. And notice this salvation, all this drops down from the phrase, you have been saved. This salvation is not of yourselves. This salvation is the gift of God. This salvation is not of works. To what end? So you would have nothing to boast in. But the purpose doesn't end there. Because verse 10 starts with the four, the explanatory four. We are as the workmanship creating in Christ Jesus to another end. Good works which God prepared before and that we should walk in them. God has created within you an eternal zealousness for good works. It's part of your makeup as a new creation in Christ. 
And so you're not saved by works, but you're saved to good works. And it, you can't put the cart before the horse. When you put your faith in Christ for salvation, what's to flow out of that, according to God's design as a new creation in Christ, is good works. You don't do good works to get saved, because no good works can take away sins. Now, there's another, pers no, there's another theological perspective that takes this the wrong way, too. Salvation, well, let's erase this, this, and this. Salvation always produces good works. Oh, really? That's a false theology. Now, it says you should do good works. That's why you've been left here, but you've got a volition. And just like you chose to come here this morning, you could, you could have chose to stay in bed. And just because God's got a plan for your life, you can choose to ignore that plan. You still have a volition. You can say, no, thank you. I'm doing this on my terms. We'll see you later. But works never produce salvation. That is a true statement. And you see, the issue of good works is not you cranking these things out, but it's a matter of allowing Christ to work in you and through you. He says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And so the fruit of good works is a byproduct of me having a loving relationship and walk of dependence upon Christ. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. The implication is if you don't abide in him, you won't bear the fruit that God left you here to do. Because the reality is, without him, you can do diddly. You can't do diddly. And this is why you and I are still here, because later in the same chapter, he says, you didn't chose, he says, he says, I chose you and appointed you to what end? That you would go and bear fruit, fruit that will last for all eternity. It's the, and whatever you do, or whatever you ask in my Father's name, he will give you in the context as that's an expression of dependence, he will work in you through you so that the fruit that God left you here to do could be realized. That's what it is. And so you've been left here to do good works. And the good works are a byproduct of presenting yourself to the Lord for service motivated by love. One thing that makes a work good versus non-work is the motivation behind it and the love of Christ is to constrain you. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, the love of Christ compels us because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and since he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And so this is not, Christianity is, well, I've got to do good works today. That's not what Christianity is. It's having a love affair with Christ so that as he works in you, those things are done. You know, when Paul ministered as an apostle, his focus on that eternal glory caused him to not only want to honor Christ, but to make a difference in the time he had left. He said this from a jail cell. He said, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, I want Christ to be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this will mean more fruit for my labor. It's funny, you could have said, if I live on in the flesh, that means more beatings, more jail time, more trouble from carnal believers, whatever it might be. No, he said it'll be more fruit from my labor. Yet what I choose I cannot tell. I'm pressed hard between two. I have a desire to be with Christ, which is just slightly better. It's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. That's his battle. He didn't say to remain in the flesh, I can still climb Mount Kilimanjaro before I die. Or shake hands with Mickey Mouse or whatever it might be on your bucket list. But you see, he knew to be with Christ is far better. You know, we all know that in principle, but sometimes in practice we don't know if that's exactly true. In the sense that I don't allow that perspective to affect the decisions I make. You know, there's a lot of unbelievers that have an idea that heaven is certainly 
It's heaven's there, but they're not real sure because of the lies of Satan. It's not. It's, it's a really good place, like I mentioned here a few weeks ago. As a kid, I still remember seeing, you know, people in heaven with angel wings playing a harp on a cloud and I think, well, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to go to heaven? Who wants to go play a harp and sit on a cloud? No harps for me, thank you. But it's interesting, I read a, a statement by a, a commentator. He says, I used to administer a nursing home and it surprised me. This guy's a believer. He says, people that are in nursing homes don't seem to think much about death and he thinks it's amazing. He said, the atheists continue to be atheists and they just kind of drift off. He said, we have some really strong Christians, cheerful and loving to the Lord, but mostly we have people who think, well, I'll wait until I'm about ready to die and then I'll get serious about eternity. But he goes, he goes but strangely, people put it out of their mind and they go about life and they don't do it. And so in their mind, as they're sitting in the nursing home, knowing the end is near, they'll kind of say, I need to figure this thing out, and then they don't do it. And Paul says, you know what, I know my time is short. I know being with Christ is far better, but God left me on this planet. And this means one thing to me, more fruit from my labor. That's it. You know, he's in jail here, and he could have wasted his time having a pity party, which is probably what I would do. But instead, he says, no, I'm not going to be ashamed. With all boldness, as always, this is always how I want to think. I want Christ to be magnified in my body, and now I don't care if I live or die. He had one objective in breathing air, and that was Christ's magnification. Not his, but Christ's. You know, he illustrates purpose, I think perfectly what to do with something when it has tremendous value to you. I used the illustration before when a girl gets an engagement ring, she's like this, you know, in front of people. <laughs> Why? Because it's exciting, it's got tremendous value, it means a great deal to her. And when you've got something in your life that's tremendous value and a great deal to you, you don't keep it under a rock, you share it with people. Christ says the most value, or Paul says the most valuable thing I have is Jesus Christ. And I want him magnified, just like a young lady wants to show everyone their engagement ring. Same kind of principle. When something's valuable, you want others to be drawn to it, to, to, to have the same joy you do in it. And so Paul's life-consuming goal was to simply have Christ magnified. Again, simplifies everything, isn't it? But, since he was going to stick around, he goes on to say in this, be confident that I am going to stick around. I'm going to remain and continue with you all for the progress and joy of faith that you rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. In other words, the only reason I want to stick around is to continue with you all in your progress and joy of faith. This is what the Spirit of God, through the new nature, puts in every believer. This is all potentially. You have the capacity to think just like Paul. The key to it for him, though, was knowing that being with Christ was far better and that Christ could come back today. That was it. But the question we asked, and it's on your handout, is why does God, why do good works matter? Why does God want this? And I touched on this last time. I'm just going to briefly review it, and then we're going to go on. But Good works provide a credible platform from which to witness to Christ. This is one of the reasons God says good works are important. He says they're critical. In the context of suffering, Peter says, if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you're blessed. Remember, this is a special privilege you have to suffer for doing the right thing. But how do you respond to the ones that are giving you grief? Don't be afraid of their threats, nor troubled, because guess what? God's already got your days numbered. You're not going to die before you should, so there's no point in being afraid. But instead, instead of wallowing in fear and being paralyzed so you don't do anything, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. In other words, set apart the Lord in your thinking. Stop and say, you know what, God's got this. He's got me right where he wants me here. He wants to use me in this situation. 
So I need to have my brain engaged to always be ready. You know, it's a mindset. As I mentioned last time, I've, I've been caught off guard more times than I can shake a stick at. But recognize that in that difficulty, God wants to use you. Don't be troubled. And he wants you to use, to a, get, use you to give a defense of anyone who asks you the reason for the hopes that's in you. What he's saying here, though, is that because you're responding differently than Joe Potato, that there's something different about him. How come he's not unraveling under these difficult circumstances? How come he's got a bounce in his step and a song in his heart under these difficult circumstances? Because the hope in Christ is more real to you than the circumstances. Otherwise, why would you have it, right? And he says, do this with meekness and fear. In other words, not arrogance. Nah, I don't care what you do to me. You guys are nothing but punks anyway, and God's going to punish you. No. It's like, you know what? It's the Lord's mercy. I'm not consumed. In fact, I remember once preaching to the, some guys at the, at the jail years ago, and I said, the only difference between you and me is you got caught, and I didn't. What have I got to boast in? Nothing. But you have to have a good conscience before the Lord, because you know what? You're going to be a conviction. When you do the right thing, and you're... Uh, around a bunch of people that don't want to do the right thing, how does that usually make them feel? It bugs them. In fact, they're going to take shots at you. They're going to try and bring you down. They're going to try and put pressure on you not to do the right thing. And so they're going to defame you as an evildoer, and they're going to revile you, but you know what? The bottom line is this. Your good conduct in Christ is going to make all the difference in the world. And so there's two things that come out of here. Verbally, you're to give a defense. You're going to be able to preach the gospel. So that's the verbal part. And then there's the behavior part. These form the platform which the message can be presented and the Spirit of God can use in people's hearts. Your words and your conduct. How you say and what you say and how you conduct yourself are big factors oftentimes in what people think of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so good works from God's perspective are important because these become the platform by which the message of the gospel is going to be warmly welcomed. I mean, like I've said, I think last time, if you're irreverent in all your actions and, and you're being irreverent in your behavior, and you use foul language and you badmouth others and you gossip behind other people's bass, backs and you function immorally, why would anyone listen to the gospel? See, that's what happened to Lot. The angels come and visit the Lot and say, Lot, we're going to blow this place to schmitherinis. You've got to get out of here. Oh, goes and tells his son-in-laws. What did they do? Excuse me? Are you talking to me? You? <laughs> he had no testimony. They laughed him out of the place. And they burnt up in the place because they didn't listen. And if he would have had a testimony, they would, they would have said, well, we know that he has something we don't have. And his word is true, so he usually knows what he's talking about. Maybe we should listen to him. How did that work out? See, if your conduct and the way you handle yourself makes no difference, it's no different than, the than how the unsaved do, what do you really have to offer them? In the sense that why should they listen? It's not like you don't have a good offer. It's just that they're not going to take it seriously. So important. Even when, you know, even when someone disagrees with your position on something, how you handle that speaks volumes. Oh, you're such an idiot. That usually doesn't help. And it's easy to do. It's easy to do. And this is why earlier in the epistle he said, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honor among the unsaved. They're going to, again, speak against you. They're going to fault find. But it's your good works which they observe. They're going to glorify God in the day of visitation, which again is in reference to the day they get saved, and your good works and how you conduct yourself as part of the equation. Well, let's see another one. Go with me to Philippians chapter 2. 
to see we're not going anywhere today either. Philippians chapter 2. Notice verse 14. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, and I have not run in vain, nor labored in vain. Now, what he says here, this is the goal, is actually a byproduct of what he said in verse 12. He said in verses 12 and 13, obviously before verses 14 through 16, he says, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but not much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, we have the meekness thing, the humility thing the reverence for God thing. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See, working out salvation, it doesn't say work for your salvation, it works out the salvation you already have. And what that looks like, we're going to see here, is verses 14 through 16. But the process involved is allowing God to work in you. See, when you got saved, you got a new nature. The light switch went on. You could understand divine viewpoint. You got the Holy Spirit, which can illuminate your thinking and empower you through the teaching of the Word of God and your response of faith to it to be transformed into the person God wants you to be. And so he says, you know what? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who works in you. God's pulling this thing off. This is similar to what Peter, or he said to Titus. He said, the grace of God teaches you to deny godliness and worldly lusts. It's God working in you and transforming you. It's not, I'm a Christian now, I can't do the dirty dozen, the nasty nine, the filthy five, or the sinful six. Those are now off my list. No, any unsaved person with some moral fortitude can pull that off, and God's not impressed at all. So it's God who works in you, both to will and to do. And so he works one to will, that's to give you the desire and the understanding. So he's illuminating your thinking. And secondly, the word do there, Greek word that means to energize you. Energeo. God energizes his children to give the desires, to do the right thing, and then the power to see it fulfilled to obey him and serve. He says, oh, you obey how? By God working in you, both to one to do of his good pleasure. That's how this thing is done. This is why God gave you the Holy Spirit when you got saved. That's where the transforming grace and power for Christian living come from. And this is a present tense. God is continually working you, seeking to energize you to, do this, to this very end. To do that which is what? Pleasing in his sight because you belong to him, and it's your privilege to please him in every respect. That's what it is. And you know, hold the, hold the whole basis for this, you know, the word, verse 12 starts with a therefore, right? Well, what's the therefore there for? It's a hinge, which means the previous information he gave is to be part of this equation. And this is a byproduct, verse 5, of letting this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He, became, he came in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of men, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, death on the cross. That's the mindset of verses 12 and 13 illustrated by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the perfect example. He's the epitome of self-humiliation. In terms of function, 
he was God and he chose to become a man. In terms of function, he was the epitome of man and chose to become a slave. And as a slave, he died a slave's death, the worst death you could die, crucifixion. And he deserved none of it. He willingly chose to do it because he wanted to obey the Father. He wanted to have the Father exalted. He wanted to do God's will. And that's what the Spirit of God is trying to do in all of us. To have the mind be in us, which is also in Christ Jesus. That's the foundation for the exhortation that comes in verse 12. If I'm thinking like the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to say, I'm going to have a yielded mindset that says, you know what, Lord? Thank you for saving my sorry soul and giving me eternal life for free. I just want to yield myself to you because that's what Christ did. He yielded himself to you. I don't want to claim my rights. I want to yield my rights in service to you. I want to do your will. And so it's a matter of having that mindset and allowing God to work in you and through you to see that fulfilled. Do you have the mindset of Christ? Do you want to see your Heavenly Father glorified in life? Or do you just want to just, you know what? It's my life, thank you. I want to live it on my terms. And you're certainly free to do that. But to what end? And why did God leave you here? And what is your purpose for living? And your life is a vapor. And so what are you doing? What am I doing? You know, living the Christian life is not robotic. It's responding, allowing the love of Christ to constrain you and responding to your Savior by faith. There's a dynamic involved where there's a love relationship as you walk in dependence and you live the Christian life the same way you got saved, trusting Christ to do something in you and through you that you could not do for yourself. You know, Christ did this all voluntarily. Did you notice that? It says he emptied himself. No one put a gun to his head and said, you know what, this is how it's going to be, thank you. And no one's doing that to you. You've got to choose yourself saying, you know what, Lord, I want to be your servant because of what Jesus Christ did for me. Thank you for giving me the resources in Christ to see it done. Thank you for you being willing to work in me and through me for your good pleasure. That's what it is. Christ willingly did this. He willingly took on the posture of a slave. He willingly said, I've come here to do the work that God left me here to do. And he did it with love and joy. He couldn't have been any happier to do it. And that's why true spirituality is always the means to doing the will of God. You don't do the will of God to be spiritual. You've got to be spiritual to do the will of God. And that's having the mindset of Christ. And so, God's working you through you. How? Oh, boy. Be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's your call right there. And God then works in you both to one do his good pleasure. So what does this look like? As that happens... I'm going to do the things I feel like doing without complaining and disputing. Right? You know, nobody likes this word all here. <laughs> really don't like starting my car 29 below zero and it screams and barks and whines and chokes and pukes. And, well, it's sure cold outside. No, do all things without mirroring. In fact, it's in the present tense. It means keep on doing. The word for complaining is gagusmos in the Greek. It's an audible expression of inward dissatisfaction. It's an audible expression of one's discontentment. It's out loud. It's an undertone of murmuring. And he's saying this because there is some division in the Philippian church. In fact, you've got the Eudeus and Syntyche camp. So there's some murmuring and disputing going on here. And, uh, right? You know, grumbling's pretty much a way of life among the unsaved. If you ever do an evaluation of what people talk about during break is mostly what? 
complaining. Right? And we're guilty of it, mercy. It's second nature. But everyone grumbles about their boss. I coached baseball for eight years and basketball for six. I had a few grumblers, right? They grumbled the teacher, they grumbled at the children, the pastor, the politician, the weather, the price of everything. Are you a grumbler? I mean, if I called up your family members and, or coworkers or roommates, whatever it might be, and says, so would you say so-and-so is a grumbler? Oh, man. Are they a whiner? Oh, man. You know, it's, it's really hard to see whining yourself, but it's really easy to see it someone else. So after I'm done with them, then I call to the other person. So what do you think? No. <laughs> We're to do all things without murmuring or disputing. Disputing carries the idea of being outwardly contentious. The complaining is more of an emotional aspect. The disputing is more of an intellectual aspect in the Greek. You're arguing against something. Funny word to rejoice without, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. The opposite of this. You know, when you find yourself blaming others for your troubles and internally murmuring against God, you know better than the Israelites. And we read the Israelites and say, what's their problem? Right? What's their problem? Are you contentious, by the way? Do people dread dealing with you because they know you're hard to please, you're a fine fault, or everything's a big deal? And you have a hissy fit when you don't get it the way you want? Well, I've got a right to complain. Oh? Why is this important to God? The word that means in order that you become blameless and harmless, son of God without fault in the midst of a what? Crooked and perverse generation. We're to be shining as lights in the world. Are you a shining light? Are you a shining light? You know, to be blameless and harmless doesn't mean you're perfect, doesn't mean you ever make a mistake. It means that you're honest with your failures. It means that, you know, you don't vindictively talk, try to run someone into the ground. And it means that you conduct yourself in a humble way with meekness and, and fear, that you're not harboring ill will towards someone and you're not out to provoke, provoke conflict and, and engage in backbiting and all the rest of it. The word harmless there means without, means undiluted, without mixture. You're not one way at home and like the guy I used to work with. I'm only a Christian when I'm at church. No. No, this is important to God because you might be the only Bible someone ever reads. That's kind of convicting, isn't it? The last thing I want to do is give someone the ammo they need to reject Christianity. And sometimes people are looking for it, looking for it everywhere, you know? But he says, you hold fast, you hold forth the word of life. And so this is important to God because it becomes a credible platform on which we can witness. Paul said this in Ephesians, for we were once darkness, now we're light in the Lord, we're to walk as children of light. You know, the world around us is going to hell in a handbasket and they need the gospel. And if we're not gonna give it to them, who is? But if we don't have a love in our hearts of the Savior, and we're not walking in humility, they're probably not going to listen to the message anyway. In fact, Christ said this earlier in his ministry. You're the light of the world. 
You see, it is said as a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand so everyone can see it. It gives light to all who are in the house. So, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father in heaven. This is God's plan for you and God's plan for me relative to being a light in a lost world. So are good works important? There's one reason they are. There's more. And by God's grace, we'll talk about it next time. Let's pray. Father, we're humbled again as we consider your plan for us. We thank you that you saved us by your grace, and we know that we can only function in a way that honors you by that same grace. And I pray that that grace would grip our souls, that the love of Christ would constrain us, that we'd see that you've left us here for the purpose of good works, and we'd see that they have got tremendous value, not only in your eyes, but in the eyes of those that you've put us in contact with. We pray for the lost around us, those that we do have contact with, that they could understand the gospel and that we could be a vehicle to that end, a vessel of honor that you could use through our words and through our good works so that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ could shine in unto them. We thank you, Father, for this instruction from your word. May we me with humble hearts just take it to ourselves and may you use it in our hearts for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.